Off a day, I'm Staff Sergeant Mark Fletcher. And I'm Staff Sergeant Kevin Dawson. Welcome to Team Anderson Update, Year in Review. Kevin, it's hard to believe, but ATV and Team Anderson Update marks his first year anniversary next month. Our show began in January when former 36th Air Base Wing Commander Colonel Dennis Larson opened the show. Hi, welcome to the first Team Anderson Update. I'm Colonel Dennis Larson, the 36th Air Base Wing Commander, and Anderson TV has entered a new age, video. For the last 18 months, we've had some great people working to make this a reality. And why? Because we want to keep you better informed with what's going on on Anderson Air Force Base and around the Air Force. Our mission from the beginning has been to keep Team Anderson and the island aware of events that have occurred on Anderson Air Force Base. Since January, Mark and I have produced over 150 stories. A lot of stories. When we come back, we'll highlight some of those stories that had a significant impact on Team Anderson. You're watching Team Anderson Update Year in Review. We'll be right back. <laughs> The 13th Air Force have had a very successful year. All of our units have met challenges head on with a character and talent that has earned distinction. In this season of giving, we are reminded of your service and your sacrifice. You've made the world a much safer place. We want to thank you for your commitment and your caring to our Air Force and to our community. For that, we are so much better. And finally, from our house to yours, we want to wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas and a and Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Alcohol abuse is a grave mistake. Hello, Team Anderson. I hope each and every one of you are having a wonderful holiday season. We've had a great year at Anderson, and it's been a direct result of the hard effort of each and every one of you. I really appreciate all that you've done and look forward to great things in 1996 as we approach new challenges here at Team Anderson. This has been a wonderful year, and 1996 is going to be even better. From each and every one of us in our home to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Welcome back to this one hour special edition of Team Anderson Update Year in Review. You know, training has been the focus on Team Anderson since the beginning of the year. While these scenes may look real, they were part of a simulated attack response exercise. This is a security police response exercise evaluating the base's ability to deter a terrorist threat. Units participating included the medical group, fire department, and security police. In March, the 613th Air Communications Squadron held their own mobility exercise. Staff Sergeant Kevin Dawson has that story. The sound of weapons fire in the jungle may mean it's hunting season. But recently, these sounds were a part of the 613th Air Communications Squadron's training exercise. As Tech Sergeant Susan Adams tells us, these training exercises are held when the unit has a significant turnover of personnel. This is a learning um, exercise. For some, it's the first time they've ever had any mobilization uh, job training and therefore what we look at mostly is to see how the team builds, how people that are strangers, new here to the unit, work together, build a team and work as a team handling different situations. We have heart attacks, we have food poisoning scenarios. Um, the lieutenant, our section commander, was a case of mistaken identity for a mass murderess. How did they react to the fact they had to arrest her? How they survive and operate under stressful situations as a team. But don't think this training is only fighting. The training scenarios run the gamut from the routine to the unexpected. We learn how to deal with the heat, with the stress, with the physical requirements for this job, with the boredom. Uh, we do psychological harassment also, wherein we play um, bads and bone for hours on end and see how people deal with the constant noise or do they tune it out. 
I believe it's worth it. With the situation in the world right now, you never know where you're going to get sent to. Next, we have Somalia and Haiti, and we have the Gulf War. So yes, it's a very necessary training that we provide. Our mission here on this island, since the unit has been here in 1990, they consolidated the 4th Combat Com Group, which is our heritage, down to the 613th Air Communications. We have provided emergency communications for typhoons, the 8.2 earthquake we had here on the island. Um, we've been to the Philippines for Mount Pinatubo evacuation. We've been to Bangladesh for cyclone relief. Disasters or us is a secondary motto of this unit. It's not all tactical communications, but also humanitarian relief efforts. Early one hot morning in July, the base was put to the test again. This time, base personnel responded to a major disaster. Staff Sergeant Mark Fletcher explains. Base personnel responded to the call for help near Anderson South a little after 8 a.m. While this scene may look real, they're only simulating what possibly could happen in a real-life situation. What you have here is a major accident response exercise that was conducted, that is conducted by the base exercise and evaluation team. What's the purpose of it? The purpose is to test uh, Team Anderson's capabilities to respond to a major disaster, in this case, a major accident involving a chemical. Okay, the fire department's role is uh, initial hazmat response. Their total job out here is to come out here and protect the people that are unaffected by this, to court on the area, to find out what we're dealing with, to stop the leak if possible, and to protect the people, like I said, that were unaffected by the accident. According to the Wing Exercise and Evaluation Team Superintendent, this type of exercise is only one of many exercises Anderson participates in annually. Back in January, we conducted a ma another major exercise, which we call a attack response exercise, where we took the, uh, the Wing through various threat con con conditions and, and having our security response forces respond to those various threat conditions. Uh, there are earthquake exercises that we conduct. There are uh, vehicle accidents, there are uh, a lot of other different types of exercises that we conduct and it's pretty much dictated by once again the, the plans that we're implementing at the time. Despite temperatures near 90 degrees, evaluators say these type of exercises are very valuable to the Air Force. Even though the, the heat is uh, very excessive but uh, it's realistic, this is where it's going to happen, this is how hot it's going to be when it does happen. And uh, I think every time, every time we exercise, we're going to get a little bit better. You know, Kevin Anderson also participated in joint exercises this year. In August, members of 13th Air Force were deployed to Thailand for Cobra Gold 95. In October, Anderson participated in Tempo Brave 95, a joint exercise involving U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, as well as a combined force of the Royal Australian Military. Senior Airman Leon Arnoff has more. Exercise Tempo Brave is part of an annual training program that allows U.S. forces to work on their compatibility in joint task force operations. This year, approximately 120 Australian military members joined with U.S. forces to make Tempo Brave a fertile joint and combined training ground. As one of the more capable uh, forces in the region, there will often be situations where we can bring the technical and military expertise to bear on a problem, especially in the command and control sense, but we might not have the military power, the, cap the, the capabilities uh, to assist. And so in that way, the United States and Australia complement one another very well in this part of the world. The CISCON operations manager, Captain Richard Cook, says a lot can be learned from an exercise like this. When we interact with a foreign nation, in this case the Australians, or for that matter when we work with, the, with our own army, the United States Army, the United States Navy, or Marine Corps, we would learn something else. We always learn something new to in turn uh, try to make sure that we can all work together that much better in the event of, our, of an actual crisis or world situation. The Anderson Air Force Base year-round mission is contingency support. For exercise Tempo Brave, mission accomplished. According to base officials, we can look forward to more exercises in 1996. In medical news, the composite health care system has been around the Air Force for almost 10 years. Active duty, retirees, and dependents should be a part of this system. If you're not, you may have a hard time getting an appointment. Senior Airman Tanya Morton explains. The composite health care system, known as CHCS, is a computer system designed to help provide patient care in DOD military treatment facilities. Not only will your medical information be stored in a computer, but it will also be readily accessible at any base around the world. 
According to Captain Joseph Anderson, CHCS should be online within a few months. Until then, to get an appointment at the clinic, you're required to register in the standalone appointment system. Basically, if somebody is not registered in either one of those two computer systems, we can't give them an appointment because the patient doesn't exist as far as the system is concerned. Uh, so in order to prevent those kinds of delays, we're trying to do as, as much of the CHCS registration before the system actually goes live. If you and your dependents have just arrived, you need to register at the outpatient records section in the clinic, even if you were registered at your previous base. The reason being is that at the moment we don't have uh, connectivity for the DEERS check uh, with uh, facilities that are off the island. So we need to do a DEERS check internally uh, before we can register the patients. Even if also somebody is already registered in our current appointment system, which is called SAS, the standalone appointment system, they still need to register again in CHCS. So for the folks that are coming in in the next couple months, they, uh, the active duty sponsor will be asked to register through their orderly rooms in CHCS. But also we ask that uh, those same sponsors come to the uh, outpatient records section and when they turn in their records, they'll also be asked to fill out the SAS registration form at that time. Once you're in the system, there's no need to check out when you PCS. However, Captain Anderson says you do need to re-register at your next base. We've got to take a quick break. Plenty more ahead on this special edition of Team Anderson Update, year in review. Mrs. Kikonis and I would like to wish all members of Team Anderson a very Merry Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Aaron, Christopher, and Colleen and I wish you the merriest of Christmas, the happiest of New Year's. To the folks at Base Operations and the Weather Shop, the Control Tower, the Plan Shop, and down at Nimbus Hill, the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. The merriest of Christmas, whether you're here with your family or far away from home, know that you're always in our hearts, our thoughts, and in our minds. We appreciate everything that you do for us and for the squadron. Again, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Also, to all the folks at Team Anderson, we wish you also the merriest of Christmas and the happiest of New Year's. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah to the Logistics Group. Olivia and I want to wish you all the very best of holidays and thank you for the fantastic job you've done over the past year. For those of you that are fortunate enough to have your families at home with you, enjoy them. Take care of each other. For those of you that are, have families that are separated, uh, people are deployed, take care of those families too. Thank you again for everything you've done. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Welcome back to Team Anderson Update, Year in Review. Anderson was the hotspot for many VIP visits throughout the year. In March, PACAF Commander General John Lorber visited the base. In an interview with Public Affairs, General Lorber discussed how readiness and quality of life play an important role in today's Air Force. Well, see, I, I, got, I put two things in two little baskets here, and I keep it very, very simple. You know, one's readiness, which I'm required, uh, that I'm responsible for, and the other one's quality of life. And you can't have one without the other. If you start worrying about uh, readiness and you disregard quality of life, you'll find pretty soon that you don't have any people to work with. Mm -hmm. That uh, they choose another line of work, not because they don't want to be uh, serving, uh, but just you, you have forced them out because it's just too difficult. So quality of life is critical for the readiness portion of it because uh, if you got people that are taken care of, uh, they're able to fight better. And they're more concerned about uh, getting ready to be ready to go. Other VIPs making a stop on Anderson in 1995 included Secretary of State Warren Christopher. The Secretary of State was on a return trip from Hanoi, where he took part in the opening of the new U.S. Embassy. Also touching down on Anderson's flight line was the President of Indonesia, President Suharto, Jeopardy's game show host Alex Trebek, and the Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Sheila Widnall. After touching down on Anderson's flight line, the Secretary of the Air Force was taken to 13th Air Force, where she held a press conference. Local media was on hand. The Secretary discussed the importance of Anderson Air Force Base in the Pacific and where she sees Anderson's role in the future. Well, I'm, I've always been in, very impressed by Anderson's location and by the quality of the facilities. Uh, the last time I came through Anderson was a time of great um, uncertainty in the world and, and a lot of concern about what was happening on the Korean Peninsula. And as they came through the region, we had an opportunity to review the plans that were, were put together to respond to uh, uh, potential uh, actions. And uh, clearly Anderson was uh, very much a part of that. And it remains a very important resource for the Air Force. 
This is Dr. Winnaw's third visit in the Pacific. The secretary says Anderson and other bases in the theater have a very important role to play in the region. The uh, United States views itself as a Pacific nation. Uh, we believe that we play a really unique role in contributing to the peace and stability of this region. Uh, I'm extremely impressed with the Pacific Air Forces. I've had an opportunity to fly with them and to visit virtually all of the bases and to spend time with the senior leadership. And uh, you know, it's obviously a, a first-rate operation uh, with an extremely important mission. After the conference, the secretary visited the new youth center, and then she was off on a bike ride around the base. Anderson Air Force Base and Guam have enjoyed a great friendship for more than 50 years. To help commemorate that friendship, a storyboard was donated to the base. Senior Airman Tanya Morton has that story. Base officials, Team Anderson members, and members from the Anderson Civilian Advisory Council attended the storyboard dedication. The storyboard displays the strong bond Guam and Anderson have enjoyed for more than 50 years. We celebrate an extended relationship with the people of this beautiful island. It's not just a relationship, but in fact, it's a deep friendship. The people of this island have been inextricably involved in military affairs just because of the course of events. But in fact, they've gone further than that. They've given their hearts, opened their homes, and shared their friendship and their families with airmen for more than 50 years. Uh, we decided to, to have something that could be of remembrance to, uh, to all those folks that are passing through this terminal here. I'd just like to express my deepest heartfelt uh, appreciation of having this opportunity to um, share today's moment of what's behind me as a sharing of part of our culture on the Chamorro culture along with, with our uh, mainland folks. The storyboard will now be seen by more than 48,000 men and women who transit through Anderson's AMC terminal yearly. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Throughout the year, many veterans have returned to the Pacific for different ceremonies. In March, more than 600 veterans returned to Iwo Jima. Some of those veterans had the opportunity to visit Guam and the base. First of all, the mission was that we were going to bomb uh, Osaka, Japan, and uh, about uh, Two seconds, one or two seconds before bombs away, a uh, shell came in, hit uh, right in front of my pilot, blew him apart, his face and all, and uh, he was killed instantly. The plane went down, and but the, for the grace of God, we uh, uh, came out of it because instead of going into a regular spin, we went into a flat spin. That's just one of the many stories told by the veterans who were at Iwo Jima. 62 vets took a tour of Anderson, which included a stop at the Arclay Memorial and Northwest Field. Sarah Bernal's uncle, Ira Hayes, was one of the Marines who raised the flag at Iwo Jima. Returning to the island for the 50th anniversary was very emotional. Well, when we were landing, you know, we, we were coming down and I, we went around the island and I saw the Iwo Jima, I mean, uh, Mount Sabachi. I saw the little, you know, flag down there and uh, I just had this feeling, you know, and I just, uh, I felt really emotional. And when we landed, I felt the same way when I saw everybody stand there, you know, they we had to shake hands with everybody and walk to the hangar. And when we made it up to Mount Sarbachi, um, just looking at that flag and all that, and uh, I just, you know, really hit me that it was, that he was one of the men that raised the flag. 50 years ago, we were sent over here to do a job. The job is done. 50 years is gone, we are here. Now to see how things are going. It's peaceful here. It's quiet. The mission has been over for Albert Pierce for 50 years, but not the memories. 20 veterans from the China-Burma-India campaign were selected to relive the Burma hump, which included a flight aboard the C-17 from Calcutta, India, over the hump to Kunming. Between 1942 and 1945, 650,000 tons of cargo were delivered across the Himalayas and to China. The Burma Hump is considered one of the world's most treacherous air routes. Years ago, we didn't have much time to think. We had to do, and we would do what did what we were told to do. And what, Get the uh, drums of gasoline, load them up, 400-pound blockbusters, get them over there because they need them, ammunition, whatever they need, we had to get it there. 
On a visit to Guam, the veterans had a chance to tour Anderson's Heritage Room Museum and the South Pacific Memorial Park located just outside the base. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Breen was born in Guam. Colonel Breen says he's seen a lot of changes in the military in the last 50 years, but knows the mission he and other veterans carried out still continues in today's armed forces. Well, I think everybody admits, and, and the present Air Force, especially in the area of uh, air mobility with aircraft to resupply combat troops, that's the name of the game now. And essentially, we started that over in, uh, 50 years ago. And it's just unbelievable how the, the services have advanced in technology and weapon systems that we, we didn't envision in 50 years that we'd have. The veterans attended commemoration ceremonies in China, Hawaii, and India before returning to the mainland. In August, 20th Air Force vets along with the Navajo Code Talkers spent some time on Anderson. Senior Airman Katrina Connor has more on their historic visit. Fifty years ago, Albert Smith entered the Marines as a radio operator. What he didn't know at the time was his language would be instrumental in the outcome of World War II. During the war, the Code Talkers delivered U.S. military information throughout the Pacific. Using their Navajo language, the Japanese were unable to break their code. Retired Marine John Brown Jr. says the Code Talkers had a major impact on the outcome of the war. I believe that the, uh, I think we have a decrease the uh, the length of time when the war is supposed to be over. Uh, we we feel that our language and our our, our participation as a Code Talker has shortened the war in many in many ways. The Code Talkers' exploits were classified for 24 years. It wasn't until 1969 that information was released concerning their mission. Making the trip back to the Pacific has had special meaning for Albert Smith. Many of my friends, just about all the company that I was with, from the, from the Marshall, Marshall Islands to Saipan Island, Tinian Island, and Iwo Jima, those men, my friends, what they have contributed, that I'm also coming to, to pay my respect. While in the Pacific, the Code Talkers and 20th Air Force vets had the opportunity to visit Saipan and Tinian before returning to the mainland. Every year, Americans around the world take time out to recognize those men and women who fought for our freedom. On November 11th, the island held two very special ceremonies. We begin at the Assin Bay Overlook. It was a day to remember and to say thanks to those military veterans who fought for our freedom. Veterans Day activities began with a wreath laying ceremony overlooking Assin Bay. Before the actual wreath laying, the governor of Guam, the Honorable Carl Gutierrez, praised veterans for their sacrifices to the United States and to the island. We will never tire of saying thank you to the brave souls who suffered and died to keep us free. And so to the memories of those who lost their lives here and to their dedicated comrades who are still with us, I say thank you, thank you on behalf of the people of Guam. We will never forget what happened here. We cannot ever fail to understand the role of veterans in our lives because we have all been touched by them. We cannot fail to recognize our obligations to them because without them we would not enjoy the life we have. And we cannot fail to recognize them on days like this because on at least one day a year we have a duty to pay homage to them, those who served. After the speeches, a wreath was laid at the foot of the memorial, symbolizing the end of the 50th anniversary of World War II, and never forgetting those who so proudly made the ultimate sacrifice to preserve our freedom. By July 1944, Guam had been held by Imperial forces for two and a half years. After two days of heavy naval bombardment, Marines of the 3rd Marine Division, as well as the 1st Marine Provisional Brigade and the Army's 77th Infantry Division landed. For the next 21 days, combat raged all across Guam, leaving 8,000 casualties. Our respect for our veterans has not come from news reports or history books. 
It has come from direct experience. It has come from the stories told to us by our mothers and our fathers. It has come to us from the pictures of loved ones whose lives were lost in our own backyard. For their outstanding service, both past and present, veterans were awarded Veteran of the Year from their local vet organizations and their communities. Afterwards, as part of a nationwide ceremony, a bell was rung 50 times, representing 50 years of no world wars. Many came to pay tribute. All came to remember. I, if I have to speak of regret, I regret that my father is not here today because during World War II, during the occupation, he, along with the fellow Chamorros, fought to keep that freedom. While many veterans live to tell the tale of combat, some aren't so lucky. Remains of probable U.S. service members missing from the Vietnam conflict are now returning home. Their first stop, Anderson Air Force Base. Many famous dignitaries passed through Anderson, but there are some, even more important, you may not be aware of. With the normalization of relations between the U.S. and Vietnam comes the opportunity to excavate and return the remains of U.S. servicemen. Guam plays an important part in this process by being the first stop on U.S. soil. You know, I've reading back many times, but they never mention about uh, the, the remains coming to the first uh, in Guam. They always say Hawaii, but I think uh, uh, Guam should be included because this is where the first stop, leaving from Vietnam, this is the first stop, Anderson Air Base. Where it hits home for me is that uh, being a pilot, most of the people who were, uh, were MIAs or POWs during the war were, uh, were aviators. And I think um, that's where it comes in personally for me, knowing what they go through and uh, what it would mean to be a POW. So uh, it was important to me to, to come and pay my respects. From here, the remains will go to Hawaii for medical testing and positive identification. If you would like to attend this ceremony, the latest information can be found in the Tropic Topics or by contacting Anderson's Public Affairs Office at 366-4202. Still to come on Team Anderson Update Year in Review, we'll have highlights of the 36th Air Base Wing Change of Command ceremony held earlier this summer, and later in the show we'll tell you what the main attractions were at the Base Fitness Center this year. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish Team Anderson and the 36th Maintenance Squadron family a very joyous holiday season. This is that time of the year where uh, we all uh, celebrate the season in our very own special ways and that's what makes it so exciting. It's also a good time for the squadron to grow as a family as we worship and celebrate and share our times together. Uh, on behalf of my uh, wife, Kyung, and my daughter, Carrie, I'd like to wish all of you a very uh, joyous holiday season and may God bless you all. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of my wife, Cherie, and myself to the men and women of the 36th Medical Group. It's been a great year, and I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I want to thank you for all your contributions in making Team Anderson the great place that it is. Merry Christmas and Happy 1996. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the men and women of HC5 for their hard work and dedication. And I'd like to wish them, their families, and Team Anderson a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You're watching Team Anderson Update Year in Review. It was time for change and recognition for the 36 Air Base Wing. Earlier this year, the wing was presented the Outstanding Unit Award by 13th Air Force Commander Major General Dick Swope. And in August, a new leader assumed command of the wing. The Honorable Lieutenant Governor Madeline Bordaglio, members of the 23rd Legislature, and members of Team Anderson attended the change of command ceremony, presided over by 13th Air Force Commander Major General Dick Swope. Colonel Dennis Larson relinquished command of the 36th Air Base Wing to Colonel John Deloney. After the formal ceremony, Colonel Larson praised Team Anderson for making the base a better place to work and live. And certainly, I think the one of the most impressive underdog victories that I've seen in my life is the victory that we made when we were selected as the PACAF Outstanding Base Appearance winner. 
but I'd like to tell you what I think the real tiebreaker was in winning that base appearance award, and that was self-help. Our self-help on Anderson is head and shoulders above everybody else in the Pacific Air Forces. We wanted a better place. We made this a better place. We made this a great place to live, play, and work. To the members of Team Anderson, there could be no better honor than joining a group of professionals such as yourself. Engaged in a profession that we all must remember every day of our lives, and that is, ours is the profession of arms. Anderson is the strategic center of excellence in the Pacific because of your professionalism. You should be proud of who you are, and you should be proud of what you're doing for your country. Kevin, you know one of the big areas that Colonel Deloney is concerned with is training. Indeed. And a large part of our mission deals with supporting transient aircraft. And the one that Anderson is best suited to support is the bomber. Team Anderson was treated to a rare sight as the B-1 bomber was displayed on Anderson's flight line. A total of four bombers out of Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, we're on a training mission in the Pacific, demonstrating the B-1's global power capability. After years of keeping the B-1 from the public eye, military members and their families now have the opportunity to glance at this powerful bird. We're just showing the airplane uh, to people, let people come out and look at it. It used to be that it was very classified and you couldn't uh, get into it or answer a lot of questions. But uh, now, uh, since we're getting out a little bit more, we like to show it to the public and uh, let them know what the plane's about and its capabilities, what it can do. People uh, are uh, interested in its speeds, uh, what, it, what it can do. A lot of people just don't know that, that much about it. Uh, the airplane got off to a bad start for maintenance uh, reasons when it was first built because it was a brand new airplane. And uh, they're just surprised at the capabilities that it can do. And uh, they're uh, interested in uh, future programs for the B-1 that uh, we're getting. We're about to get some more weapons this summer that we'll carry. And uh, so we get a lot of questions about that. Even before it was built, Anderson was intended as a base for the heavy bomber. And though there are no more bombers stationed on Anderson, they are regular visitors to Guam. Three B-52s from Barksdale, Louisiana, came to take part in two exercises. Cope North, a joint exercise with Japanese Defense Forces, and Exercise Coronet Sloop, a bombing mission sharpening the crew's ability to accurately bomb from altitudes of 500 to 25,000 feet. Munitions for this exercise are from Anderson's stockpile of 750-pound M117 general purpose bombs. So we have 27 internal, um, three racks, and each rack holds nine of these M117s. Uh, yeah, for low level, these uh, fins will uh, spread out, and that's to get some separation uh, from us since we're low level. The uh, blast frag is, is pretty uh, big. And even with combat under their belt, these aircraft are remarkably young. Hours-wise, they have about, I'd say around 15,000 hours on most planes. That's a good average use, and really that's, that's uh, not bad. When you consider the C-141s flying around, they have about twice that many hours. They have about 30,000 hours, so airframe-wise, the planes aren't really that old. But don't think military aircraft are the only ones to grace Anderson's flight line. This year, we've had everything from civilian supersonic aircraft to unpowered single-seaters. Base personnel turned out en masse the night of August 16th to view an historic event on Anderson's flight line. The Air France Concorde Sun Chaser II touched down ahead of schedule on its bid to break the around-the-world speed record. That record has held since October 13th, 1992. Well, it's the most prestigious aviation record there is, the eastbound and the westbound, the pair of them for the FAI, the international body. And I guess, uh, you know, the Army Air Service tried it in 1924, and Amelia Earhart tried it, and Clay Lacey did it, and then Alan Paulson beat him, and we're trying to beat Alan Paulson. It's history. I guess it goes back to around the world in 80 days. It's just, uh, man's always wanted to be faster and better, and that's why we got the F-15 and the F-16, I guess. Landing at Guam was critical to the flight, and was jeopardized because of recent warm weather at Guam's International Airport. This was remedied by knowing the right people. This time, the runway wasn't sufficient there. I found out in March uh, we would uh, scrub it completely or delay it till December, whenever the weather's cooler. And then a mutual friend suggested I get in touch with General Tom Stafford, who's on the plane, the commander of Apollo 10 and Apollo Soyuz. And General was kind enough to talk to the right people. The Pentagon approved our landing, and here we are. 
While the retired general helped get the flight off the ground, he did have some criticism about it. On my third mission in space, I set the all-time world speed record in the history of mankind. On Apollo 10, we achieved 24,791 miles an hour. But uh, I, before the, we left New York, I have to say this is the slowest I've ever been around the Earth. <laughs> For 36 services squadrons, senior airman Melvin Holmes, winner of a seat on the plane, the impact of the flight was only now dawning. Nervous? Uh, nervous as I don't know what. <laughs> uh, it really didn't hit me until this week, actually. Now, the moment has come, my heart is beating fast, so. For those who waited, the takeoff was quick, to the point, and very loud. Units from the 1st Special Operations Squadron from Kadena Air Base Japan and Navy SEAL Station on Guam took part in the training mission. After recent jump attempts failed because of wind conditions, the mission finally got off the ground as 16 Navy SEALs parachuted on Anderson's drop zone. Well, what we're doing out here is trying to get the Navy and the uh, Navy SEALs and uh, Air Force Special Operations crews working together on our drop zone. What we're really trying to do here is make uh, bring exercises to Anderson and this is just one of those exercises that we brought here and we're hoping that by them participating here they'll do other exercises here also. This particular exercise allows them to do their jump training, uh, their high altitude low opening jump training here on Anderson and it allows the MC-130 crews to do their uh, do their uh, low or high speed package delivery drops on the airfield all of this is all part of the special operations training that goes on. This was Hospital Corpsman 3rd Class Jason Shelton's 27th jump. While most of us might be a little leery about jumping out of an airplane, Jason says there's no other feeling like it. You get complete tunnel vision like, I mean, anybody would say. You just, um, all you see is your altimeter in the ground and you just, you know, thank God when your parachute, I guess, opens. But um, now, now it's, um, I don't worry about it at all. You know, just fall, you got a lot of time, you got 58 seconds to fall until you got to pull. And then uh, as soon as you pull, you got a good shoot and you're good to go under canopy. Team Anderson had the opportunity to put their talents to the test earlier this year. First by delivering aid to earthquake victims in Kobe, Japan, and more recently, typhoon relief to the Philippines. It was supposed to be a routine mission for members of the 8th Military Airlift Squadron from McCord Air Force Base, Washington. Routine until Super Typhoon Angela swept through the Philippines. Passing through Anderson, Master Sergeant Don Davenport and his crew were told they would carry supplies to the devastated island. Missions like these uh, are what we look forward to. It's, it's what we do. Uh, it gives us a departure from the day-to-day -day operations and it, uh, it just helps promote the image of the Air Force uh, worldwide by being able to go into the, the different countries and help them out. In wake of the disaster, the State Department's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance requested the Air Force to provide 35,000 pounds of plastic sheeting and 50 five-pound collapsible water containers. The relief effort to the Philippines is similar to the aid provided to victims of the Kobe earthquake. This, according to the 634th Air Mobility Support Squadron Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Dwayne Jones. After loading the C-141, it took only three hours to deliver the supplies to the ravaged island. While Anderson lent a helping hand on the international scene, several countries came to the base in September as part of an international symposium on logistics. Desert Storm, a war won not only by the United States, but by other nations as well. What was so significant about Desert Shield Desert Storm was how quickly the United States and its allies were prepared for the conflict. One of the keys to victory, logistics. Recently, 13 countries participated in the first ever logistics symposium at Anderson Air Force Base. And we know in today's world, if we have to do something uh, militarily in, in any region of the world, one of the things we learned from uh, from the Gulf War was that uh, it has to be on a cooperative basis. You know, whatever we do is going to be a coalition effort, typically. And the more we learn about the other countries that we might be working with in the future, I think the better off we're going to be and the better we're going to be able to, uh, to operate in uh, both logistics and in all areas in, in a uh, coalition-type effort. So that, I think, is one of the big things that we're trying to do. Countries attending the symposium included Bangladesh, India, Singapore, and New Zealand. One Commander Murray Herrick says he found many similarities between countries. 
We're talking about a lot about our respective countries. Obviously, um, the big players are the, uh, the United States Air Force in this, but I've been interested to find that some of the ideas from my own country have been equal to or that we've had similar problems. We've been able to sh share and exchange ideas um, in various small areas and logistics. Organizers of the conference hope to make the symposium an annual event. While logistics was the focus during the week, many other participants will take home with them lasting friendships and a new awareness of the other countries. In, in addition to just the logistics side of this or the military side of it, uh, we do learn a lot about the other countries, you know, and that's important. I know I've, I've learned a lot about some countries that I knew very little about uh, before coming, coming here. In fact, uh, before we started planning this, there were some countries that I had never even heard of, you know, and they're represented here this week. Uh, so I think for all of us, you know, it's been a real, real learning experience. I found the experience very worthwhile. Um, I didn't really know what to expect when I came here. I wasn't even sure of all the participants. Um, I've been delighted with the experience. I've found uh, both the representatives from the United States Air Force and the representatives from the other country have participated fully, and I've found that there's been a great in interchange of ideas. While much was learned at the symposium, education has been on the forefront of Team Anderson this year. In April, a new education liaison officer was appointed to the base. Her name, Lori Stepanek. My main responsibility is to act as a bridge or a liaison between GovGuam, Department of Education, the Territorial Board of Education, and the Anderson Air Force Base community. Anybody who has questions about kindergarten through 12th grade education on Guam, public, private, or homeschooling can come and see me. Um, if they have concerns or questions, what I would like for them to do is to talk with the people involved first. If they have a concern or a question about something happening in the classroom, to go talk to the teacher, to go to the principal. If they feel like going up through the chain in Department of Education, they can do that. Um, if they feel like they haven't gotten satisfactory uh, answers or solutions then they can come and visit with me or if they just have questions about I don't understand why things are done this way then they can come and see me. Lori along with other base personnel had the opportunity to visit Simon Sanchez Middle School in April. Their mission? Discover our future scientists. Albert Einstein was a physicist. Werner von Braun built rockets. Madame Curie studied chemistry. But one thing all these scientists had in common is they all started out as children. And to continue this tradition, F.B. Leon Guerrero Middle School held a science fair April 6th. Over 80 students from Anderson Air Force Base and local community took part. One reason that this is really important is that it gives them the chance to, number one, be creative, number two, be imaginative, and number three, and I speak as a science teacher, gives them the chance to go through problem-solving skills, to utilize problem-solving skills. It gives them the chance to go through decision-making and to basically use scientific method as a scientist normally would. To tell you the truth, from going around and looking at the different projects, there is a lot of talent that is shown here. There really is a lot of talent. I picked this idea because of uh, my favorite sport is baseball and I like to collect baseball cards so I picked this to do and I have fun doing it. With categories such as physical science, biological, math, non-experimental, earth sciences and chemistry, students kept the judges on their toes and the judges were familiar faces on Anderson. This is the second science fair that I've had the opportunity to participate in. Um, they like the participation from the military um, to come down and judge the projects here at the school. Um, the teachers here, it's hard for them to be judges because they're their students. So they would like some outside party to come in and help with the judging. The kids put a lot of work into these projects and it's obvious when you go around and talk to them some of them spent uh, days and numerous hours just trying to get their projects to work uh, and didn't give up on them. That was the main thing. They kept trying until they got their projects to work. The panel of 18 judges chose 20 students to go on to the island-wide science fair slated for May 6th. Winners of that competition will go on to the national science fair. Not all students want to become scientists. As Staff Sergeant Mark Fletcher explains, local students spend part of a day on Anderson, all part of the island-wide leadership day. Known as the Shadow Program, students learned everything from...
putting out fires to forecasting weather. These students spent the day with the 36 Civil Engineering Fire Department. Robert Borges, Chief of the Fire Protection Flight, explained some of the benefits of the program. It gives us an opportunity to talk to the local folks and have a little community relations with them. Plus, it also gives the students an opportunity to see what, what Anderson folks do and what we do for them and uh, how we can support uh, Guam and, and what they're really going to school for. Uh, some of the, the classes that they're taking right now, the educational classes, will help them in the future. Christine Labaton, a 12th grader from Ocean View High School, has lived here all her life. After participating in the shadow program, she now knows a little more about Anderson. Um, I learned about the um, behind the scenes uh, activities that take place in Anderson Air Force Base and I think it's really interesting because I didn't really like know about it until like I've been on Guam for 17 years and I didn't know anything about Anderson Air Force Base. RJ de Guzman's dream is to someday become a doctor or scientist. He learned that being a firefighter isn't an easy job. Now I know that it's really hard to be a firefighter. I thought it was like just easy. Uh, when you get students in here, you get to see what kind of takes they have on uh, life, for one, but on the job of the Air Force, the mission of the Air Force. So you get to see, uh, you get to show them firsthand how your job affects the entire mission of not only the wing, but the Air Force itself. Anderson parents have a way to help local schools through base squadrons. Partnership in Education's Adopt the School program keeps base personnel and families informed of school activities and needs. Coming to Guam in 1987 as a Navy initiative, the Adopt-a-School program has allowed Anderson to adopt five local schools. The program's aim is to get information of the needs of the school to interested members. These members could then organize and assist with these needs. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the Transportation Squadron folks here are very proud of what we have done in support of the Adopt-a-School program. We helped the school raise over $3,500 for school supplies and equipment. And most recently, we sent two or three people per week for a total of three weeks to clean, paint the classrooms, the hallways, the interior and exterior of Price Elementary School, and even water blast several areas of Price Elementary School. And all this was in preparation for the opening of the school year. This last summer, when we uh, needed help in painting the school and um, we called Sergeant Lana Castro, our adopted school representative, and she had a group here in, you know, in a matter of days. And whenever we've called on them, they've always, they've always come out. We've got to take a quick break. Plenty more ahead on this special edition of Team Anderson Update, Year in Review. Merry Christmas to the men and women of uh, Debt 5. I'd like to thank each of you for your hard work and dedication in making the Guam Satellite Tracking Station Space Command's finest and wish you a peaceful Christmas season. Let me offer you a challenge. Uh, why don't you get out that old Christmas story found in Matthew chapter 2, reread it, and ask yourself as you read it why some people found the Christmas spirit and others missed it. I think we'd all benefit from asking ourselves those questions. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank all the men and women of the 36th Contracting Squadron for all the hard work they've done this year. And on behalf of Christine and I and the family, I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> well, to all of the Arclight Defenders, I'd like to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your hard work and dedication. And from all of the members of the Security Police Squadron, I'd like to wish Team Anderson Merry Christmas. To all Mission Support Squadron members, thank you for your hard work and dedication. I sincerely hope that your Christmas is filled with joy and the new year brings you prosperity and good health. Welcome back to Team Anderson Update Year in Review. You know, Kevin, if I had to pick one of my favorite stories of the year, it would probably have to be the story you did on Booney Birds. If you are new here, you may have desire to go out and see some of Guam's natural inhabitants. But during the summer months, you may have the opportunity to have them come to you. The pair are squabbling right now. The black drongos, they're, they were introduced to Guam. They're not a native forest bird. Uh, they're, most, they're most abundant bird species on the island right now, and Anderson has one of the largest populations on island. 
They're extremely territorial. So as you'll see right now in this part of the time of the year, if anybody comes within the area of where they're nesting, then they'll, they'll dive bomb your head. That's what it's all about. They're protecting their nesting area. If you run on Anderson Air Force Base between the months of April and September, you will get dive bombed by the black drongos. Doesn't matter where on the base you run, they're definitely an equal opportunity dive bomber. They dive bomb runners, cyclists, walkers. They, they even dive bomb each other if they get in each other's territory. So as you're out and about this summer, keep in mind that these birds can easily be avoided and cause no permanent harm, unlike the brown tree snakes. For Team Anderson Update, I'm Staff Sergeant Kevin Dawson. You know, Kevin, every time I see it, that story makes me laugh. Good job. You know, it wasn't all work and no play on Anderson this year. Here are some of the happenings that got the whole family involved. In February, Valentine's was celebrated with the first ever Baby Cupid contest. Also in February, a tomorrow festival was held on Anderson. Local residents witnessed a caravel pulling VIPs, including the Governor of Guam, the Honorable Carl Gutierrez, to the conference center. It may not have been as big as a state fair, but families still had a great time in April at the annual Family Fun Fair, sponsored by Family Advocacy and the Family Support Center. Construction was completed on the new softball field, new lights, a refreshment stand, and better playing conditions make this Anderson's Field of Dreams. In June, kids spent the day competing in the annual Marine Fishing Derby at Serena Beach. In August, the Base Fitness Center hosted the Invitational Karate Championships. Onlookers witnessed some serious action. Weightlifters had a chance to see how strong they really were in the annual bench press competition. These athletes lifted some serious weights. Well, after months of anticipation, the new youth center was finally open. Some are calling it the finest youth center in the Pacific. Anderson was named a Tree City USA recipient by the Arbor Day Foundation. Anderson's the first base in the Pacific to receive this honor. This year marks the 43rd annual Christmas Drop. What started with one island and a random act of kindness has grown to a year-long event supporting 49 islands. Begun in 1954 by members of the 54th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, Christmas Drop 95 continues the tradition of bringing holiday cheer to island residents in the Pacific via airdrops. People are, are familiar with Christmas Drop, they know what's coming up, so a lot of the people are repeat uh, donators. Uh, I've been involved with the planning phases for uh, as far as the 374th Air Wing has been involved in this, uh, this program for this year. So all the planning that had been going on and the execution and uh, putting the crews together and uh, coordinating all the efforts uh, fall under my command, yes. I spent the last two months, uh, and it doesn't usually take uh, us more than a couple months to get ourselves together. The, uh, most of the work is done prior to us uh, arriving. The boxes are already made, uh, they're already pre-positioned, so it's just a matter of bringing my crews down here, uh, rigging the loads, uh, loading them on the airplane, uh, and going over the last minute details, getting the last minute briefs from uh, how we're going to work the islands this year, and, uh, and come up with a schedule of how we're going to execute. So. Again, that's only about two months worth of work. And you know, Mark, even though that plane ride took almost 12 hours, it was still a unique way to deliver Christmas cheer. What a great story. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Well, we've got to take our final time out. When Team Anderson Update Year in Review continues, we'll have highlights of Santa's arrival on Anderson. We'll be right back. Men and women of the 36th Transportation Squadron, spouses and dependents, Barbara and I would like to thank all of you for the privilege of being your commander this past year and serving with you. And we'd like to wish you a very safe, happy holiday season. On behalf of the men and women of the 634th Air Mobility Support Squadron, to all of our PACAF and Navy friends, a merry AMC Christmas. Season's greetings and happy new year. To the men and women of the 36th Communication Squadron, your dependents, families and friends, season's greetings, happy and prosperous new year. On behalf of the communication squadron, to Team Anderson, happy holidays, and a peaceful and safe new year. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the men and women of the 36th Supply Squadron for all their hard work and dedication during this past year. 1996 will be one in which we will be very busy and we'll accomplish many great things, not only in the squadron and at Team Anderson. 
please, I hope that you have a wonderful holiday season, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, not only to the 36 Supply Squadron personnel, but to Team Anderson as well. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah to everyone at Anderson. On behalf of the Public Affairs Office and our friends at the Comm Squadron, we are happy to give you this Team Anderson update year in review. We hope to improve the program as the years go on. Thank you very much. Kevin, it's been a very exciting year for Team Anderson Update. I look forward to working with you, my partner, in the year 1996. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're going to take a few weeks off for the holidays, but before we go, we're going to leave you with a little Christmas magic. Are you ready? Let's. Kevin, what do you say we leave our viewers with a little Christmas carol? Let's try. Let's do it. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We leave you with scenes of the Christmas parade held earlier this month. Happy, Happy Holidays. holidays. Team Anderson, I'm uh, Lieutenant Troy Kitch, the producer of this show. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Team Anderson program. Uh, I took it over from Captain Mike Brooks, my predecessor, who got the, the ball rolling. And it's now getting better and better, and we're already to our first year of production. It couldn't happen without Sergeant Fletcher and Sergeant Dawson, the, the masterminds 
uh, the skilled people who put this together. And uh, we look forward to doing more years of the Team Anderson Update. But remember, it can't get any better unless you give us your input. So call us and email us, do anything you have to do, but let us know what you like and what you don't like. Merry Christmas. This is Team Anderson Update, showcasing the people, mission, and...